Okay. I'm I'm waiting to see if um, two other panelists uh, will will join us, and if if not, then um, I suggest we uh, uh, we start. And also, we are gathering. I think you're more audience. Uh, I believe that uh, people are joining uh, now. Yeah. Yeah, but I will take a few minutes. So uh, when right. you join, you're probably um, talking and not uh, not not me. Okay. Welcome. In, in the next uh, 45 minutes, we will talk about the future of the unicorn concept. And it's a topic close to my heart. I am a chair of a business school, Netherlands. That's a niche private business school with, and we teach in Europe, China and Africa on entrepreneurship and innovation. <coughs> and many of our students aim to become the next Jack Ma or uh, Elon Musk, uh, of course. But today we talk about if this unicorn concept will remain the dominant concept of the future company. And post-COVID times, is there less or more scope for a unicorn? If more and more crises appear, will the company of the future change shape, maybe? Will companies of the future become like a phoenix, a company which innovates, rethinks and reinvents themselves whilst going through tough times, only to come out really stronger than ever before. And if that is true, can we already see who is the next Phoenix firm? This is how I would like um, to go ahead. Each of our panelists will present their thoughts in a statement of about two minutes. And this will allow us for 20 minutes Q&A. All participants can pose the questions in the chat box and please mention who of the panelists you want to respond. And during the session, I will invite you to make a virtual group selfie. It would be nice if you join in. It is self-explanatory, and later on the picture will be sent automatically to your email. But now, with further ado, let's have the first panelist of this session. Mario. Mario Aquino is the CEO of Future Labs a VC and corporate venture builder based in Asia and Europe. He was previously the managing partner of McKinsey Ventures and the MD and board member of Moody's Analytics in Europe, Middle East and Asia. Mario, the floor is yours. Well, first of all, uh, Annette, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. Uh, very interesting topic and uh, one that, that uh, is worth addressing. Look, if... Um, there is, if the first question is really, is the concept of the unicorn, i.e. digital natives that can create you know, like uh, impact at scale, a dying uh, concept, well, my short answer is that uh, it would be not. I think you know, we live in uh, an unprecedented era of technology and business model innovation that you know, requires you know, like, and creates new opportunities, requires you know, like, your businesses to rethink you know, their models, reinterpret, reimagine, and so there is plenty of scope you know, like you know, to create the, the next you know, unicorns and more. And in fact, you know, when we look at the statistics, you know, like we even see the number of unicorns uh, being created in that any given period of time accelerating over time, right? If you look at the period of 20 years uh, from 1990 to 2010, there were less than four, uh, 50 unicorns being created in that 20 years. And if you fast forward to the past five years, there have been you know, more than 400 you know, unicorns. And the speed and scale at which you know, like companies reach the 1 billion mark uh, is being you know, faster and faster. It took Google more than 10 years. Uh, it took you know, like Bird, one of the new digital natives, a scooter company, less than a year to reach you know, like that 1 billion mark. Now, it is fair, though, to say that um, what we see to get, give a bit more nuanced approach and answer is a bifurcation in the market. Um, on one side, we see companies you know, like, that are scaling much beyond the unicorn, one billion status to become decacorns and multi hundred billion dollar companies, mostly because we know that today in a mobile internet era, there are no more geographic boundaries or at least you know, the boundaries have you know, like, uh, decreased. But even you know, many of these companies are adopting a platform a business model uh, going from one industry to another, like, you know, for example, the likes of Amazon, you know, like Alibaba, moving from e-commerce to logistics, you know, like financial services, entertainment. 
And you know, that you know, creates also opportunities to go beyond the like, sector boundaries. Uh, just to finish, you know, when it comes to coronavirus, look, you know, of course, you know, the results are mixed. I think you know, that coronavirus has created definitely new opportunities uh, in many ways, accelerating digital mega trends that you know, would have taken you know, more like years. I mean, we all know the, the low touch economy, I guess, you know, like telehealth has become you know, like, significant, has been fast tracked dramatically. So I think your know, coronavirus you know, like, has been, you know, uh, a wake up call for many, apart from the health scare, of course, that is creating to actually accelerate digitization uh, in a dramatic way. Um, the interesting part that I would love to explore further later, perhaps, is has the source of the unicorns changed? You know, like, is it, you know, like only the purview of digital natives, you know, like kind of startups, you know, that get created in the wild, or there is a role that corporates actually can play more actively in creating, you know, the next generation of, you know, like uh, innovators. Thank you. Thank you, um, uh, Mario. Um, Maybe we can talk uh, about uh, the role of uh, corporates uh, later later on. Terry, Terry von Bibra, uh, you're the director of Numenos, uh, Germany advisors on digital transformation, omnichannel and China B2C for the private equity, VC, startups, etc. But you're also an experienced unicorn builder and you know also a lot of the play of big tech companies as you were Alibaba's general manager in uh, Europe. Oh. Terry, the floor is yours. Thank you, Nita. So, um, you know, the term unicorn in our context, um, it really just denotes an entity that at some point in time has reached an arbitrary but agreeably round number. So I guess my issue is what does the term really mean? Um, and if it doesn't really mean anything, one could argue what is the point of our panel? So um, in, the, in the interest of having a hopefully insightful and entertaining panel for our audience, um, uh, I would focus on what, what a, a meaning that Unicorn actually does has for me. And that's the following. So young companies that succeed so well and so quickly at serving one or more foundational human wants or needs and doing so at scale that they achieve a valuation of, uh, of a billion, they have found a way to tap into something that is more powerful than their own level of maturity to deal with. That's a problem. It's a nice problem, but it's a problem. They simply will not have had the time to develop the organizational depth, uh, the level of maturity, organizational values to objectively, soberly, consciously navigate the potential risks and the potential opportunities that they now find themselves confronted with. Um, so, you know, do they need our help? Uh, do they need our mentoring with this, this nice problem to have? I don't think so. Um, they're clearly onto something. And however unprepared they may be by virtue of having gotten there so quickly for that, um, they need to learn by doing. They need to go through these these mega size growing pains um, on their own. And we can either be on the inside and be part of that uh, amazing experience, or we can be on the outside and, and watch and observe and learn. Um, but I, I don't think um, there's a lot that people outside of that experience can do because it is so all encompassing um, and, and the dynamics are so, are, are so strong. Um, it's a fascinating area. I think it's fascinating um, to, to be involved with. Um, but as I said, the term itself doesn't really mean much to me. I think the valuation is completely arbitrary. Um, but I do think this situation of so much growth coming so quickly to usually organizations that are so young and immature, that is a fascinating, a fascinating topic. Terry, if I, if I may ask you a question, because you say that the term uh, to me doesn't have a lot of substance. Um, I can understand that from an investor's point of view. But if you look at it from a motivational point of view, for entrepreneurs who can aspire to be the next unicorn, for um, countries who say, okay, I'm very well um, 
organized in my ecosystems around Unicorn. Do you see the benefit of um, coining firms like that, like Unicorns? I think it can be a real distraction. Um, I was I was reading recently in the press about the um, event in France um, with uh, President Macron, where he said, you know, he set out a goal. We're going to create, I think, 25 unicorns in France and, and recently met with a lot of those uh, entrepreneurs afterwards. I think they'd, they'd actually created, you know, 12 or so. But a lot of the um, a lot of the participants from these companies were saying unicorns don't matter. It's Some of the people saying that had become unicorns. So obviously they were happy about that, but they were saying it doesn't matter because again, it's an arbitrary term. Um, and when I think of the companies that I worked at, um, the valuation was distracting for the employees. Absolutely. Frankly, in a negative way, but the founders of the companies that I've either worked at or are observed that were really successful, they were never obsessed with the number 1 billion and they were never obsessed with the valuation. They were obsessed with doing something, whatever it was. Um, what I've described as addressing a human foundational want or need, but that's not how they described it. They described it as I'm obsessed with why is it so difficult to do X when it could be so much easier to do it if we did Y. And that obsession has certainly been the common theme, not the valuation. Okay. Thank you. Let's go to um, Catherine. Catherine Kahn, you are the co-founder and CEO of Rovilus. I don't know if I pronounce it uh, well. <laughs> A clean energy startup accelerating adoption of electric power through sustainable batteries and enabling circular economy. Tell me, um, what can you say about the topic? Right. Thank you so much, Annette. And it's a great pleasure to be here. And I think it's very apt that I'm, I'm speaking the last coming after Charity and Mario. <laughs> We are definitely a startup that's aiming to be you know, what, what you would call a unicorn status. But echoing what Terry has said, I do believe that is a vanity metric for a lot of companies out there. Um, that is something that can be very distracting, but at the same time, is something that investors would love to see. So there's some, perhaps Mario could um, chime in a little bit more on that as to, you know, if a uh, a company's focus on building their business? Is that something that that is key or core to what investors would evaluate based on? Um, so a little bit more about this topic and my view on it. Um, myself, I'm the um, CEO and co-founder of Rovelis. And what we're doing is we are creating sustainable batteries by combining hardware and AI to power all vehicles and storage applications through a circular economy. Um, so my take on this, having operated in Taiwan and we just recently started our office in Singapore and also in the States, I think is that uh, there are a lot of um, unicorns out there. And I think it's a concept that's not going to die. It's going to continue to exist. The key issue is whether it's riding on the mega trends that's currently changing our economy right now. Um, so just throwing some statistics out here, Crunchbase recently did a study on 133 unicorns. And the most common year of establishment of these unicorns is in 2007. So that's a subprime mortgage crisis year. Um, so we know Uber, we know um, Airbnb, they spawn from that. So I do believe in a crisis moment, um, what the, it, it's actually a driver for these companies to lot, latch onto these mega trends and um, be able to build their companies to scale. It's definitely will you know a, a trend that would drive away a lot of these existing companies that's not riding on these trends. So we can see that pre-pandemic, I think the global economy was on this curve that was basically built on decades of globalization, um, IT um, IT adoption and resource ex ex extraction. And I think that that model of take make waste that that is something that's not going to be sustainable and. In this era, we have started to realize that post pandemic, we have realized that these mega trends, um, such as decarbonization, such as healthcare, such as, you know, um, actually the unthinkable of working from home and 
us being speaking on the same panel, despite being in different locations, these unthinkables are coming, um, are, are accelerating. It's coming, you know, uh, it, it's actually surfacing fairly quickly than we have anticipated. So startups and companies that's riding on these mega trends, I believe, are the ones that will try by the end of the day. And with, with regardless of what their valuation is, with regardless of whether they hit the unicorn status, the decacorn, the hectacorn status, like, like TikTok, I think these are companies that will definitely be able to be more sustainable. And if they ride on these trends of building a more sustainable uh, uh, ecosystem and trends such as, um, uh, you know, accelerating um, accelerating the, the digitalization and adoption of a more of a more, uh, I, I would believe, uh, a circular type of, of system. I think these are definitely trends that companies can work towards. Um, I think the question is how long would it take for these companies to actually scale to what uh, to reach the unicorn status um, uh, we call it. So, say for example, um, I think the unicorns have slowed down since 2019. Um, the rate of them coming up in IPOs. Uh, there was a recent um, article on that on Financial Times as well that that the China's uh, unicorns have basically slowed down, and there was a fall of thirty percent on the same period of time um, in twenty nineteen as compared to twenty eighteen. So, how long would it take for companies, um, you know, startups like ourselves, to be able to reach that status? That's a key question. Obviously, the other question is, investors care about their exit strategy. Should valuation matter? Um, uh, should the billion dollar valuation matter? I think that that's another question uh, I would love to hear the panel to discuss about. Thank you, uh, Catherine. Um, let me um, uh, take a, a little break and uh, start the group uh, selfie. And then after that, maybe Mario, you can answer uh, Catherine's question. And no doubt, uh, Terry, you have some good advice for Catherine uh, uh, as well. But let me uh, start uh, the group uh, selfie. Can you see it? Yes. Okay, good. Um, Mario, give some advice to Catherine. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes, wonderful. Well, first uh, I was going to uh, mention indeed uh, that drawing uh, on both Terry's and Catherine's you know, perspective uh, you know, what matters is really creating sustainable businesses, right? You know, ultimately, the valuation is an output metric. It's not an objective in itself. But unfortunately, as Terry was hinting, uh, many times and oftentimes, uh, it does become, you know, a true north, but at the same time can be also a negative true north, right? Uh, I, you know, what, what, I, uh, uh, what we look at as an investor and also as entrepreneurs is to build you know, like great companies that you know create you know real value in the market you know by addressing real market pain points right you know whether they're economic or more and more I guess the trend is to look you know, like much more into sustainability as well you know Catherine you're in that one of the big you know, like uh, mega trends you know, like that because that becomes important you know, for the world of course it's you know, like an opportunity to do uh, well by doing good. Uh, which is even more important uh, uh, going forward. So I would say that, look, for investors, of course, ultimately making a return is super important. But, you know, much of the good investors would focus on creating great businesses and therefore entrepreneurs and founders that you know, look to create great businesses more than just you know, like, uh, have a fad of uh, a market valuation that is unreasonable and uh, not you know, like commensurate to reality. Okay, and um, Terry, you um, have uh, worked in a number of unicorns, and maybe you can address uh, Catherine's uh, remarks about the internal meaning of the valuation. Sure. I mean, um, I've uh, I've worked at, at three, or actually, I guess four. If we count Ant Ant Financial, which is about to leave the private sector and become public. Um, um, but they're they're all now public companies, but um, you know, in my experience, valuation, as I said, has been is distracting. Um, and it's not that the numbers and the business side don't, you know, don't matter. Um, I think the culture, the organization culture is more interesting. But when it comes to the numbers, you know, I remember in my experience um, at, at Amazon, when Amazon made the first billion dollars revenue, um, you know, 
it's for me it's still amazing amazon now i think did 280 billion but i remember when we did the first billion globally it was a very big deal it wasn't about the valuation it was about the fact that we'd done a billion dollars in revenue no profit um and getting employees excited about that that was only positive right that was and that round number again it's an arbitrary number but it meant something because it felt real like we're we're a real business we've really done something um but there's other numbers like shortly after that when we took out uh, the company took out a loan for 2 billion um that had to be paid back and if you're not making any money how would you pay back a loan that scared employees and that was also good because that scare helped to motivate people. We've really got to work hard. How are we going to pay back $2 billion where we're not generating any cash and you can only pay back loans with actual cash? So um, I think the numbers are important, but I think it's more about the culture. And so, Catherine, for example, in your company, you know, what is, what is it that the, the teams are obsessive about? If it's about the clean tech aspect, right, then the most powerful thing about um, a company that has the potential to become a unicorn is the organizational culture. It's the hardest part to change in existing legacy companies, and it's the most powerful part of a startup. And the uh, the obsession is often what helps tie that together. So, I mean, I'd be you'd love to hear Catherine's view of you know what is it that she says is in her company that people get really excited about valuations aside. What really gets them excited and obsessed about? Because that's your most powerful asset. Absolutely. Thanks for that, Terry. So um, I think we're absolutely right. Uh, I'll just I'll just give you an example to that. In terms of valuation, when we talk about it, uh, we're a bunch of engineers, right? So <laughs> when the engineers think about it, they go, "Oh, great! Uh, that's something that, that that's great to have." But it's it's not something that that excites them, that, that really drives their passion. So what we're doing is we're working on extremely high power batteries and those batteries can be uh, can enable a circular economy by translating that battery down to a lower power application and down to the lowest power application to completely fully utilize the battery value. Because right now the high power battery is just simply just being disposed and we have an AI system that tracks all these batteries so we can collect all the module data. And that data is the key and the vital core to actually lowering um, battery repurposing costs. So you see a lot of, a lot of battery technology companies out there um, talking about battery recycling. A lot of them are doing it at cell, battery cell level, which is these individual cells that go into the battery packs. Um, battery cell level data is not sufficient to uh, basically drive down the battery recycling costs, uh, repurposing costs for, for battery modules. So we are doing, we're basically plugging in that missing, missing people, the puzzle in this whole battery um, repurposing uh, ecosystem. So back to what said, uh, yeah. <laughs> back to the question indeed. Right. Okay. Yeah. You're an engineer and a very passionate <laughs> engineer, but go back to the question about your team. So the engineers, the engineers are extremely excited when we are able to work on a project. Like, say, for example, if we work, what we have worked on, we have talked to um, General Motors about our technology, and things like that really excites them. And and once we are able to test a certain product with them, um, that is something that really drives them and push them to innovate. Or the negative emotions that you mentioned earlier, when somebody questions them about their their technology and what they're doing, like say for example, uh, we recently have a, a a case with a public company in Taiwan, and when they're being questioned by the engineers, the CTOs, that's something that pushed them to uh, you know really innovate, really sit down and think about what we're doing. Um, so these are the things that really drive um, our team. In essence, um, it's not so much about how much we are you know, uh, how much our valuation is. It's not so much about how, um, you know, how many pitches we have done. It's more about how, where we have put our technology to and what changes we, have uh, we, we, are, we are driving. So one of the key kind of um, thing that push forward, push the team forward is to be able to work on projects like, like those with GM and larger companies, but also projects that actually drive social change and social impact. Um, so one of the cases that we're doing is to electrify an island in the Philippines. And that is something that's really interesting to us because we get to do the whole ecosystem. We get to do the marine vessels that ferry people back and forth from um, the islands. We get to do the microgrid part of it. We get to do the charging stations. We get to see actual impact on the people that are living, that's living on the island. So that is something that I think um, 
to it, it really is it's something that drives to our core and that's something that really drives us forward even though we know how much um you know some of these cases may not be ideal from the investor's perspective um but from the business perspective and from from the way we are uh you know uh, it brings back to why we started this company i think those are the instances and the situations that really drive us and it reminds us of what we're really passionate about so back to your question on uh on on you know is this valuation matter yes it does it, it matters so that we can bring in more money for the for the company but we instances such as um these that reminds us of what we're passionate about is something that's core to the team is something that we really bond over and it's good um, Catherine that you mentioned that it's also interesting for you to work with bigger companies um and maybe that can be um a bridge to uh, what Mario you wanted to talk about a little bit how can corporates uh, become the unicorn uh, innovators uh, of tomorrow yeah i guess you know, the broader context and that uh, where we come from is that uh, look uh, uh, we've been you know, like uh, on both sides of the equations right we've been uh, uh corporate executives you know like corporate advisors you know like uh but also entrepreneurs and uh, we, you know we know that entrepreneurship in, a, in in the wild creates a lot you know like of new ideas new innovation early stage but you know we also know how difficult you know like is for uh, companies to scale startups to scale and i would argue that you know like today actually uh you know, given that the cost of creating the end startup you know, that does the same thing as the other hundreds of them uh, has come down significantly so you see a proliferation of uh, you know startups in the wild and many it and so has become a lot more challenging uh, for any given startup to become the next you know, like unicorn right because now there really you know, there is a huge you know, hugely crowded market you know, like over there uh of course there will be continued you know, like opportunities for unicorns to come you know from uh you know from innovation in the wild but we would argue that actually uh corporates especially those that are led by forward thinkers uh leaders have a real opportunity to leverage on the scale of their assets uh you know they do have advantages you know they have huge customer base at scale they have data at scale they have, they have also a degree of av available capital and you know, like um, if you know, like they can actually reinvent themselves a little bit you know, like you were suggesting with the concept of a phoenix there given that you now uh what matters they, they have huge underutilized assets that can be redeployed you know, like into new uh markets uh, you know an example in point you know, like i would say uh, could be you know, the ones you know, that um uh, Terry you will be very familiar but amazon i mean one of the reason why they created aws is that they found themselves uh, you know being uh, having you know, such a um, you know number of data centers that mostly you know were not utilized you know, throughout the year and thinking creatively about can we leverage that asset at scale to then you know redeploy it you know, to create a new business opportunity and um, so i think you know, there are tremendous opportunities for companies today given that sector boundaries are been blurring uh, to create you know, the next you know, like uh, set of uh, new ventures or uh, unicorn players now i do think you know, that uh, however uh, they need to recognize that there are a lot of barriers as well i mean the first one that i would say is mindsets i mean uh, the culture and the type of talent that you know most of us in is in corporate uh, you know it requires the right leadership to think you know, like you know, about you know, not just digitizing the core of an organization but how do they generate the next you know, like 1 billion or more a uh, business opportunity as a new venture i think you know, the second you know, like your typically barriers is you know we were discussing earlier among us is this you know, like legacy i mean you know, of assets etc and so in order for an innovator an incumbent to be innov innovative uh, they need to think your know, clean sheet you know, like in our view and really incubate those you know, new venture opportunities in a completely different set you know, like uh, or set up you know, like than their core business um and then finally a lot you know, like frankly in our experience boils down also to providing the right the right risk and incentive measures right attracting the right talent uh you know we discussed you know like Terry and both Catherine highlighted the ultimately in the world of technology what matters is still the people and so if you know the ability to attract the right talent 
uh, cocoon them you know, like in the in an environment that you know shepherd them uh, through without you being bottlenecked by the legacy assets, but actually where assets are only brought to the venture when they're additive in terms of their scale up becomes you know, like a great way uh, for companies to continue to innovate. And actually, we're seeing more of and more of that. I mean, examples uh, are Amazon, Alibaba in many ways, but actually in Southeast Asia. Companies like Axiata creating your know, like uh, financial services. Uh, we are working you know, like with some of the financial institutions uh, to actually go into uh, uh, you know healthcare and telehealth you know, like uh, because of their assets you know that they have. Uh, so uh, you know there is a number of opportunities. I mean Lipo Group you know, like here in Indonesia creating a new financial services you know like payment with Ovo, for example, right? So there are a number of examples you know, like uh, in corporates you know like uh, taking more. Uh, a, a, an active step you know, to think you know, like about how can they create your know, significant value stepwise as opposed to just you know, transforming their core uh, you know in a way that uh, largely is incremental to be fair and uh, uh, has not led that to the type of impact you know, like that uh, one would want to see thank you uh, mario um, time uh, is up. Um, I think uh, we had a very interesting uh, discussion, but uh, time is up. I uh, like to give a big thank you uh, to all the panelists. And um, if you like to know a little bit more about the topic Phoenix versus Unicorn, then I can recommend uh, you the book of Peter Hinson. He wrote the book, The Phoenix and the Unicorn, which was published earlier uh, this year. And it is a very thought provoking uh, book. But for now, thank you panelists and um, enjoy the rest of the sessions uh, of today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You, you're still here. <laughs> I, I cannot hear you because your phone is uh, switched off, I think. Okay, it should be good now. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Uh, yes, but uh, you just missed the session. Oh. We just um, um, actually concluded it. Wait, it said our session was at Central Time. Uh, it but uh, uh, never mind, because I think we still have um, a few people um, joining us. So um, why don't you just... Um, make your contribution. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you want, do you want I, I, to do that? Yeah, the let me, time. Did it? Let me, let me introduce you then. Um, okay. Uh, okay. Barak, I mean, you're a serial entrepreneur. Eh? You're a partner at uh, Radical, and you build what you call radically different software products and services, specializing in gaming and digital broadcasting. And in addition to that, you're also the chief mentor at iCreate, an international center for entrepreneurship and technology. 
So please go ahead and um, let us know what you like to say about the unicorn concept. Okay, first of all, my apologies. I, I'm, I'm in Italy, and uh, I thought the session started in additional 15 minutes. So, so uh, I apologize for that. Uh, basically, what uh, what what my thought process around uh, unicorn companies were <clears throat> is that valuations are just that valuations, right? Uh, and and the classic example that I always use uh, is: uh, Has anybody wondered why? Uh, uh, WhatsApp was worth nineteen billion dollars, right? We 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 start talking about unicorns and valuations, and doesn't generate a penny in revenue. How is it worth that it was valued at nineteen billion dollars? Well, there, there there are certain fundamentals to to valuing a, a technology company. A majority of the unicorn product are, are all technology companies. It's either <clears throat> the traditional business valuation models that we have is a multiple of revenue, multiple of profit, uh, forecasted uh, potential and all that stuff. But another key ingredient to valuation in, in Silicon Valley or in Israel or any other uh, active entrepreneurial ecosystem is the number of users <clears throat> on your platform. So if, if, uh, if WhatsApp had, when it got acquired, it had 700 million users. And traditionally in Silicon Valley, a user is valued at ten dollars, so they would be worth seven billion dollars. It still doesn't math doesn't add up. That how do you value that company at nineteen billion dollars? Well, the reason nineteen billion dollars was paid for for uh, WhatsApp is because their argument was that they eradicated that much money from telecoms books. They took away nineteen billion dollars worth of revenue from phone companies globally be it on the data side or be it on the voice side. So why am I not worth that much? If I'm displacing that much revenue, why am I not worth that much money? So the unicorns are created around valuations, right? And, and it, it's, it's basically, it's, it's notional, it's fictional, it's, it's, it, it, it materializes when you go public, when you sell uh, and all that stuff. But the focus should be, how do I actually build a company that, in the perception of the investor is worth a billion dollars. Be the investor, a, a private investor, a fund, the market, a bourse, whatever it is. There are multiple avenues of getting there. And what the point I'm trying to get to is for you to become a unicorn, you either have to displace unicorn value or you have to create a foundation of users that are worth a uh, uh, billion dollars uh, or you truly have to generate revenues uh, as a multiple uh, of, of becoming a billion dollar company. So now going back to, is that space going to be alive? Look, time will tell. But I think what COVID has done is it has pulled in a lot of people in terms of doing domestic stuff rather than doing international stuff. And does that mean globalization is it has ended? Absolutely not. But is it dented? Absolutely. Right. And so there's an opportunity in an adversity and the opportunity being, if you look at China and India, they very easily can ramp up to 100 million users of a product or a service uh, because they have economies of scale. They can also offer a product or a service for a very small fraction of the cost of the U.S. or the, or, or the European Union or Israel or whatever it is, and they can get to the revenue stream. Uh, fast enough to be a billion dollar company. So absolutely, the companies that start focusing inwards, and you're seeing this already, you're seeing this in China and India. You, they, for, for, for decades, they never had a billion dollar tech startup. Well, there's umpteen of them coming up. I mean, you look left, right, and center, and, and they're everywhere. Uh, and they're, they're challenging the norm in every industry, in every aspect. These are not just Ubers anymore. These are not just the TikToks anymore. These are companies that are even going to manufacture. So it's not just the tech play on the user side. It will also be, I know of several companies, which I think potentially in another five, six, 10 years can become billion dollar companies in India, especially some of them are, are affiliated with our incubator. They, they are building uh, electrical bicycles that uh, are very, very cheap for the Indian marketplace. Now just think about how many bicycles you can sell in India. You can sell a lot no, of bicycles. You can sell a lot of bicycles in India. And can they become a billion-dollar company? Absolutely. 
absolutely just due to the sheer product category that they have picked. And Pak, um, one of the uh, other participants um, said this one billion uh, dollar mark, that, that's actually very distracting for it is. Uh, Yeah. 100%. But like I said, you know what? It's an it's a notional and a fictional number until you actually capitalize on it. It doesn't really matter what your series A or series B or series C values you at. Who cares? Just go focus on your product. None of these companies that became mega companies ever, their goal was never. Bill Gates never started Microsoft because he wanted Microsoft to become a billion dollar company. Or for himself to be worth 90 billion bucks. It just, it just, it, it, that was a result of his vision. Uh, and, and go ahead. Yeah, I was uh, going to uh, ask, we also discussed that what is most important in terms of the value apart from the business model and apart from the product and the uh, one billion um, dollar mark in a startup for an investor to invest in it. Uh, Apart again, from the money and, side, yeah, and, and an astute investor is not really worried about the valuation when he gets in, right? They 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 they, they want the valuation to be lower. When you're buying, you want the valuation to be lower. It's when you're selling, is when you you want it to be higher. So when you're bringing your money in, nobody wants to to invest in a billion dollar company. They want to invest in a four million dollar company that eventually will become a billion dollar company. Right. So from an investor perspective, it's a distraction as well. I don't think they care about it. The matter of fact, the, the, the real big investors always want to get in at a very early stage because they want to take that exponential bet. They, they, they know how to make 10 percent return. I mean, they would invest in an exchange traded fund. They, they, they wouldn't risk it on a company. Right. It's those uh, X multiples is what they're chasing and that they don't get in. It's probably the, 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 the Series B, Series C rounds where they're investing again and again and again is to prevent themselves from dilution. I mean, it's it's matter of fact, I want more because I believe in this product. I believe in this service. And the valuations keep going up. My dollar is now six, so let me put some in at six. Do some dollar cost averaging, buy more shares, right? And then it becomes 10, I want a little more. So uh, that I think from an investor perspective, uh yes the the eventually they'll get to the billion dollar mark but none of them are looking to invest in a billion dollar company i mean uh, by then it probably most of the time has hit the the exchanges anyways if you were to choose as an investor uh, parak uh, between uh, a startup um, which has a very good product a very good technical uh, solution for something or a startup which has a very good organizational culture Which one would you choose? Well, you got to remember an organization doesn't build a product. You can build an organization around the product, right? So if, if, my, if my CTO is not good enough, I can go and get another CTO. But just because I, the classic example I use is because you can speak German doesn't mean you can become a poet in German. If you are a poet, then you can learn German and you can write poetry. But just because you speak German doesn't mean you can write poetry. So you got to go for the poet and then teach the poet the language rather than saying, I speak German, how do I become a poet, right? So an organization cannot really build a product. They would still have to go out and look for the people that are going to build the product. So I would, as an investor, I would chase a product company and not a company that, that's well-organized because that well-organization, like we have seen, is... Uh, Two sexual scandals away from from a large auto company walking away from you, right? So I mean, you you could be very well organized. You could be worth billions of dollars personally. Your company could be worth tens of billions of dollars. Two scandals come out, and boom, you're gone. Yeah. So focus on the product, right? Focus on on the technology because guys and people are replaceable. I mean, resources are replaceable, but the technology. If somebody is building something, and and there's there's, uh, I'll give you a classic example: Israelis. As as uh, innovators, they every single moment they look for an opportunity rather than complain about an adversity. I met a I met a PhD in Israel, and this guy is in water resource management, and his whole point was everybody in the world is worrying about conserving water. Like, how do I get a piece of the water? There's wars all over the world over water. How come nobody is working on a solution to prevent evaporation of the water that you already have now? 
So you you have a lake yeah. and water is evaporating. Why don't you work on a technology to conserve the water that you've fought for and you have? Because close to 70% of the water evaporates over a long period of time. So invest in technology. But now that's the thought process, right? Now, he is going to build a product which he has. is doing extremely well. That basically you throw this little ball on top of a lake. Multiple balls, they stick with magnets. Water evaporates into the ball, condensates, and falls right back into the lake again. It doesn't let it just go away. He recaptures the evaporated water. Now there, I don't... I don't need a solid company. I need a scientist. I need a product. I need an idea. Yeah. And that's what I would invest in. Smart, uh, smart idea. Um, on my screen, now it says time is up. Oh. The talk uh, has to end. Uh, Parag, Absolutely. thank you very much. It was nice uh, to meet you. Uh, my apologies again. Sorry no, for no problem. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.